This is Ake Arts and Book Festival 2021 online. My name is Lola Shone, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to one of our intergenerational conversations. This particular one is about religion and spirituality, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce and to welcome Oyinda Mola Fakeye, Wada Abbas, and Jide Adigun. Thank you very much for being part of this. So I'm going to jump right in. We're talking religion and spirituality. And I want to know a little bit about your background, each of you. So I'm going to start with Oyinda. We can go then to Wada and lastly talk to Jide. But the idea is for you to tell us a little bit about where you're coming from, what religion you practice, and what spirituality means to you as an individual. Hi. So for me, I actually did grow up in a Christian home, but I definitely think that I chose my religion. So, and I'd say I'd been practicing maybe since around 10 or 11, where I made the decision to be a Christian. And for me, it actually really informs everything I do. I'd say it's the way I live my life. It's the choices I make. It's the words that come out of my mouth. It's the way I work. So it's actually, I say it's the foundation which I build the house that is Oyinda from. So yeah, I'm Christian. And yeah, it's, it's, I think it's important to who I am and it's going to continue to inform the decisions I make as I move into marriage, raising a family and progressing, I guess, in work as well. Thank you so much. And coming to you, Jide, next. Hey, thank you for having me. My name is Jide Samuel Adigo. I'm an atheist, humanist, whatever label people want to give to that. I was actually born in a Christian home. I grew up a Christian, grew up in church, playing the keyboard and also learning the Bible and functioning as a leader in the church. So a couple of years ago, I gave up my faith due to, you know, reasons that we might go into later in the discussion. But essentially for now, I am an atheist, I'm a humanist, I'm a naturalist. I consider spirituality to be a sort of middle ground between extreme religion, so to speak, and extreme, you know, atheism, as some people put it. It comes across to me as though there are many people in the modern world, you know, in Nigeria, for example, who see that there is a whole lot of dogmatism and restriction that comes along with religion and they don't buy into that anymore and not just the dogmatism and restrictions but also the claims that certain religions like christianity and islam make and um, they they see that they can't really square that with their scientific knowledge of the world but they don't want to go you know all the way to the other extreme as well. They don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, as some of them have said to me. So what they do is to try to find the middle ground there where they espouse, you know, some kind of transcendent feeling, some kind of connection with the divine, so to speak. It's more or less like doing your religion on your own terms, so to speak. Um, that's how I picture spirituality um, within the context of how people use it nowadays. Thank you so much, Jihye. And what about you, Ada? Yeah, I'm a Muslim. I grew up in a Muslim home. Both my mom and my dad were Muslims, but I didn't actively choose to start practicing as a Muslim until I was, I think, between the ages of 17 and 18. And this was because I'm growing up, I didn't quite understand, maybe apart from the reason that when I asked my parents why we were Muslims and why we chose this religion, we were told that, you know, because we can feel, the, even if we can't see God, we can feel his presence around us. And it was just based on monotheism. But I feel like I had a lot of questions growing up, like why we pray five times a day and the likes, because I felt like it was just so stressful at the time. But as I grew up, I came to realize that the idea that came to me later was, it wasn't like an inconvenience, like maybe God wanted to just make us inconvenient by asking us to pray five times a day. So I felt like it was something that was designed for us as human beings, a sort of spiritual practice where there is 
a lot going on in the world and we have a lot of issues we have work we have school we have a lot of headaches to face every day and you know just establishing a spiritual connection with god five times a day felt like a time to refresh a time to like take our minds away from this world like connect to something higher and just to recharge so it felt like something that was designed for us and that was when i started exploring what islam meant and yeah i decided to start practicing at the time i'm gonna take off from what wada just said looking at what was on the ground what your parents you know were doing and what you've now decided to do as an adult yourself so the question that i'm really getting at is how would you compare where you are now in terms of your belief in religion how would you compare that to what you saw growing up yeah i i feel like i've gone through a number of phases because i was trying to learn this religion like separate from what i grew up knowing at home and I feel like as human beings, like generally we have a lot of questions and there are so many things that we are not able to reconcile about religion. And I feel like we may not even be able to reconcile some things even as we grow older and even until the end of our lives. So, but I realize that in most cases, African homes, like especially here in Nigeria, the homes are not really a good place to have difficult conversations when it comes to religious beliefs and questioning things. So in organized religion, like in a religion like Islam, we have um, different beliefs, even amongst different sects. And, you know, you just have to find out what message is being passed down to us by different organizations, by different sects. And you just have to like sit down and, you know, like, for example, I have certain beliefs that I know that my parents didn't have. My father actually was is more religious than my mom my mom is this kind of you know i don't know how to put it she just she just believes oh i believe in god and i'm a muslim and like that is all you just pray five times a day so for example the head covering my mom actually believes that it's not um, really compulsory for you to cover your head or for you to wrap your hair as a muslim because she's always like islam is more in the heart than in what we do outwardly as a muslim i will i will say that my father is actually a more religious person but he is also kind of a bit more liberal when it comes to outward aspects of practicing the religion but the reason why i decided to start wearing the headscarf was apart from the fact that i actually found that it's a part of the religion even though there are so many debates going on right now about whether or not it's compulsory to wear the headscarf and i feel like i have a more relaxed stance on whether or not the headscarf is compulsory so but i felt like it's it was just something that i had to do to remind me from time to time of who i am during difficult situations where i feel like i'm drifting away from my feet so it was more or less like personal to me when i decided to start wearing the headscarf so there are so many other aspects like that like so many other things i chose for myself that are actually different from what i saw growing up in my home no, th that's incredible because that means that you had the space to choose. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, 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 I did. Yeah, I did. Oyinda, how would you say that your faith compares to your parents? So for me, I pretty much grew up in a single parent house. So I grew up with my father. I mean, my mom passed away when I was nine. So I believe she was probably the more spiritual in our home. My dad is Christian, but he thinks I'm much more <laughs> religious than him, <laughs> which I find really funny because I would never call myself religious. I mean, I think it's my way of life, but I, I find even the terminology religion a bit of an interesting one. So yeah, for me, I jokingly say that, you know, God brought me up himself. I was never forced to go to church. I'm not one of those people that whose parents forced them to go to church or uh, to read their Bible or anything like that. I think I started going to church on my own when I was about 13 and have done so ever since. And even in my wayward years or my teenage years, 
I laugh with my friends because we always remembered, even if we were bad on, you know, if we even if we were at the clubs or whatever, we were like, no, we have to be at church. So for, so for us, we had the conviction ourselves that everything else we were doing was kind of just, it was never going to be enough. So when I recommitted, I guess, myself to my religion, like in my 20s, I'd say maybe about 21, it was just always a part of my life. And another thing is that what I found is that everywhere I've been, I've always had this like church home or family. So when I was younger, I was Anglican and I had this Anglican church that I used to go to as a teenager. I had this charismatic church that I went to when I went to uni. It always felt like home and it always felt like the most comfortable place for me. So I've always had this follow me in all the areas of my life. So even now, my dad thinks that maybe I go to church all the time and stuff. And I'm like, oh no, I actually only watch church online at the moment. And I definitely had the room to be whatever I wanted to be, but I definitely more religious, quote unquote, uh, are more spiritual. And actually I can't say I'm more spiritual than my dad because my dad is very spiritual, but he also believes in He's Christian, but he believes in looking at like Yoruba tradition and things like that. And he's very spiritual. So he might not be Bible bashing Christian, but he, everybody had the room to be whoever they wanted to be. And even my sister is marrying a Muslim, you know, and my dad doesn't have a problem with that because he is of the same opinion as your mom in that he believes that your faith is in your heart. When I asked the question at first about religion and spirituality and what you know what you practice and believe, you actually told us about your religion, but you didn't tell us what spirituality means to you as an individual. Do you want to tell us about that very quickly before we go to GD? Sure. I mean, I think for me, spirituality is, I mean, maybe I didn't make it very explicit, but I think it's how you live your life. It's the decisions you make, it's the choices and it's the why. And so for me, I just truly believe that there is a God. And I believe that in my spirit, that it's through spirit that I'm able to connect with my God. But then I also believe that everything is spiritual as well. So yes, there is a physical world, but the physical and the spiritual are happening at the same time. So in encounters that I have that might seem physical, I see the spiritual spirituality in it. So even if we look at something like fasting, why do I fast? You know, it's from a spiritual place. I don't drink and I don't smoke, but I have in the past. And I made those decisions based on my spirituality and wanting to have that space in my spirit to be, to have clarity. So for me, spirituality is really, it's a personal walk that everybody chooses to either do consciously or unconsciously. But I believe that everybody has an element of spiritual walk that they have to take and nobody else can do that for you. You have to walk the journey yourself. And truly when people leave, like when people die, we don't mourn because of their body. We mourn because of their spirit, you know? So there's a lot that happens in that spiritual space for me. Thank you so very much for going back and, and answering that. Um, so, Jide, over to you now. Tell us a little bit about your parents. I'm very impressed, by the way. I just want to say this because this is not what I expected. A lot of us, um, people from my generation, were pretty much forced into whatever religion that they're practicing. You're born into it and you damn well stick with it. But what I'm hearing about your parents and the sort of kind of freedom that they gave you to choose, I think is really impressive. So I'm really dying to hear what Jide is going to say and what his experience has been. Well, in my case, I, I wouldn't really say that my parents forced religion on me. To be sure, I've always been fascinated by the Bible, even as a little child. I used to win the Bible debates and quizzes back then in church and all that. So I had this interest in the Bible on my own growing up. Although when I became a teenager, I had, of course, when I got into university, I had a shift in my theological view and I wanted to start going to some other church and my mother resisted that at the time so i guess that was one of the first places where we had the tension about a switch in religious views and 
over time, my religious journey has been very personal to me over time. And right up until the point that I gave up religion altogether, it's always been like that. We've always had some tussles over doctrinal issues between myself and my parents, my dad sometimes, my mom sometimes. But it was never something too difficult. It was never something that caused um, any serious rift between them and me. Although when I became an, an unbeliever, um, so to speak, I was hesitant to tell them about it because I knew they weren't going to take too well to it. So somehow, somehow my mother got to know and she came over to my room because I was still living with them at the time. And we had a conversation about it and she was really sad. She was really sad and it, it kind of broke my heart that she was that sad because I, I don't like to see her cry, but that happened. And I just tried to reassure her and tell her that I'm still your son. I still love you and nothing has changed. Um, this is just what I think right now and doesn't change anything about the son that you've always loved and known. And that's how we've been, I mean, ever since then, it's always been uh, like that. So it's not like they forced me to go to church or anything like that. But then I have to say that, you know, there's this kind of, when you're not forcing someone actively, but you're doing it in a passive way. For example, you make some suggestions as to what kind of things are allowed or what kind of reactions you show towards one person rather than another. And this wasn't even me that experienced this. It was something that maybe someone like my elder brother who, you know, he's not even an atheist or anything like that, but sometimes he just didn't really buy into the whole church, stringent religion kind of thing. And my, my mom didn't really take well to that. She would complain about it. She would scold him. She would urge him to go to church and, you know, worship God and do all these things. But he just didn't really buy into that. So it wasn't like it was forced or it, it was, it wasn't really something too aggressive, but there was this passive kind of, if you're not doing this, you're not on the right path. You're not being a good son. You're not being impressive to me and things like that. And that's the kind of thing that I notice um, in some families around. And in some places it's even worse because they, um, I've read stories about I see these kind of stories more in Islam, I should say, and this is not to throw a bullet or something. When you, you see someone who says he doesn't want to go to the mosque anymore and the parents take him or her to some place for him to be punished or beaten or, you know, stuff like that. It's those kind of things. We, my family, I never experienced that kind of thing in there and none of my siblings ever did. But in any case, there's still this, you know, kind of passive way of trying to get your children to follow your religious path and um, that, that's kind of what i experienced but i've always found a way to maneuver that terrain and that's the position i'm at now i should say thank you so very much and just to carry on from what you were just saying i imagine that the reason my parents and uh, the parents of other people in my generation were so strict is because they truly believed that that was the way to set their children on the right path, on the path of righteousness, on the path of success. So I want to kind of throw a little question out there to you all, and I want to bring this home to Nigeria since we're all Nigerians. So given what some of our parents were doing, trying to, trying to make sure that they instill the right values and they set our feet on the right path as far as religion is concerned. The result of that is that we do live in a pretty religious society. I think if you go outside and you look at the number of churches and mosques and, you know, just houses of worship, anyone would conclude that, yes, you know, people are religious, you know, in this country. But... And then you look at the behavior that one encounters, that one reads about, that one hears about. And I'm talking about the, the levels of, I mean, the crime, the violence, um, the, the rape, the abuse of women. And you're thinking to yourself, there's so much religion, yet we have all these problems. So my, my question to you is this, does Nigeria need more religion or less religion? Does Nigeria need people to be more religious, in your view, or for people to be less religious? 
I'll start with Warda. In my view, I personally think that what we need is actually more spirituality than religion because what I've discovered about religion is that most people out there are practicing these faiths without actually, you know, getting to know what it is that they're practicing. And there is a dogma out there that a lot of people follow that actually requires them to throw reason and intellect out of the box and just accept anything that they are told to do or anything that they are told to believe. They don't weigh these things on the scale of whether they are actually moral things to do or immoral. So, for example, as kids, when we were kids growing up, we had our parents tell us that religion was actually a very great tool to kind of maintain order and you know morals and in the society but there has been this gap between the ways that um, a lot of people practice religion and what we know as morals that like the difference between what is good and what is bad so for example i as a muslim i feel like there is a part of my faith that's actually emphasizing on being a good person and being a good person i feel is relative but it actually has a lot to do with what your conscience tells you is good against what is bad so we have situations where people come up and in the name of religion ask us to do weird things and these things are actually things that go against our conscience as human beings so in this situation i feel like that's where spirituality comes in because spirituality is the ability to be able to connect with your spirit like your conscience and to what your higher purpose is as a human being and to be able to act on that rather than what religious dogma is out there for example we know in most religions like islam and christianity we know stuff like adultery fornication and the likes are actually forbidden so we have situations where people go extreme on these issues and label people as prostitutes and whatever it is. And we have had situations where bad things happen to people that you label as unreligious or not Muslim enough or not a born again Christian. We have situations like this where people refuse to empathize with those that they have labeled as deviant. And when bad things happen to these people, people believe that they deserve bad things to happen to them because they feel like it's things like that were justified because they weren't even good religious people in the first place. And I feel like these are some of the issues that are causing the problems that we have in the country, like in Nigeria right now, where people don't get to distinguish between what is actually good and what actually makes sense and what you are told is the religious thing to do. Yeah, I think that's my comment on that. Thank you very much. And um, Oinda? Thanks. I think that was a really good start to the answer. And when I moved to Nigeria, I moved to Nigeria in my 20s, and I remember thinking, oh my gosh, Nigeria is so religious. I couldn't stand it. For me, with faith, I think faith is a choice, and being able to choose your faith is the first step. You know, with Christianity, it's not really meant to be that, oh, your parents are Christian, so you're a Christian. No, you actually have to make the decision to be Christian. And I think having a society that is so religious and like it, it feels that Nigeria has actually actually well most nations that have religion or a lot of religion use it as a tool a power tool and if you look at the way our governments work I think a lot of people feel like they don't have power they don't have authority and the religion gives them this place of power and authority and they're able to place themselves on a hierarchy of importance and say you know or maybe I sin different to you, or so therefore I'm better than you. And that's the way I feel that religion is really used a lot of the time in Nigeria. And so for me, I don't think we need this type of religion and, and law that really restrict, hurt, and break people down. I believe that we need to, you know, really come into a place where our faith actually makes us whole. And as whole human beings, we are empathetic, we're kind, we think about other people, we are not selfish. And I remember, I think many years ago, hearing hearing that, you know, one of the churches, they, their 
mandate was to have a church on every corner, right? So that it was walking distance from people, so people could walk there, which I think was a, like a beautiful mandate for the times. But now we have churches on every corner and people are driving to their church, so they don't even have any sense of community. So where a church or I guess a religious building was meant to be a place of family and, and love and care and community, it's now just become like these places where people tick attendance and in ticking that attendance, they may be able to say, okay, I've fulfilled righteousness for this week, or maybe, you know, I can stunt on the ground or something, you know? And, and so I think that it's really very, very different and separate the type of religion that we practice here and what I think about when I think about community religion in, in loving and caring for other people and you know, people argue with me a lot and they say like, look, religion is a one-on-one -on -one thing. It's, it's just about you and your God. And I say, yeah, maybe religions are, but I believe that Christianity is a religion where it's you and your God and then you and your community. Because in our religion, we believe that God is three in one. All, I mean, if you look at the stories, you'll see God chooses a man or chooses a woman and separates them and has a relationship with them, but always sends them back out to the people. So it's always about saving a people group, calling a people group back, reconciling, healing, wholeness, and all of that happens in community. So for me, it's an important thing that I think has just been perverted through power, um, power dynamics. That's really interesting. It sounds like you're saying that if your religion isn't people-centered, and focused on the advancement of the community, then perhaps it's not quite what it should be. And I want to talk to Gide now. I know that you embrace critical thinking and you think it should be introduced to Nigerians quite early. Where does that fit with a society that is drowning in religion? Sometimes it's a difficult thing to try to actualize because I happen to think that, at least based on my own experience with religion all around me, I happen to think that the vast majority of the way religion is practiced actually counteracts critical thinking. You find people who tell you, for example, that scripture is their sole basis for learning about life, and not just learning about life in terms of you know getting facts and stuff like that, but also getting morality, which we're going to try to come back on to see what we can talk about the previous question as well. I think it's very crucial for critical thinking to be introduced early, but it seems as if there is always like a pushback to that whenever we try to bring that into the educational setting, for example. And it's not even so much as something systematic. It's just something that people just don't really care about because, I mean, it's just something. That, for example, when I was in school, when I was in secondary school, yes, I learned about evolution by natural selection then, which is, um, it's basically the central core of biology. Anybody who studied biology at a higher level will know what I'm talking about. But it was treated with such, you know, a cavalier attitude at the time because everybody believed that God created Adam and Eve from sand and breathed into them. And I think this is a doctrine that Christianity and Islam share together. So because of that, people just don't really take evolution by natural selection seriously. It's just like, oh, it's just something they teach us in class, you know, to talk about homo erectus, homo habilis, and all those things. But then we're talking about something that is so crucial to biology, and not just to biology, but to healthcare. Because, for example, during the COVID period, it's the, the idea that we have from evolution that helps to tell us, okay, this is how we can create vaccines to tackle this virus and curb it. And because we lack, you know, the necessary foundation to have this kind of scientific knowledge, which is in, which principally due to the fact that people are so tethered to religious dogma that they don't even, you know, want to consider scientific knowledge in that sense. It's because of this that we have that. And because of that, it's so difficult for us to make the progress that we need in these avenues. And it's not just limited to critical thinking as a whole, but even in moral discourse as well. I've had a lot of discussions with apologists, Christian apologists, and people who try to defend religion. And they basically tell us that if you're not religious, if you don't believe in a God or something, or if you don't trust the Bible or the Quran, you can't have a foundation for morality. 
And I was actually a bit surprised that neither of my co-panelists seem to espouse that view because um, you know they get their morality apparently from empathy and you know looking at suffering in the world and you know feeling that sense of camaraderie with other people out there which is something that i find very very beautiful but for the vast majority of people in nigeria for example they think morality literally comes from the bible it comes from the ten commandments or it comes from the quran or it comes from the sharia law or whatever it is and all those things form an impediment to critical thinking and not just critical thinking in terms of scientific or mathematical knowledge but also critical thinking in terms of moral discourse how exactly do we organize our society for us to have a progressive and a more livable place and this is one of the things that also feeds into corruption as well because for example if you have the belief that you can do whatever you like all you just need to do is just go ahead and ask for forgiveness or something like that it's going to somehow weigh into your moral decision because you're not considering the other person you're only considering yourself you're being selfish in that situation and you know that kind of doctrine can lend some support for that kind of behavior it's also problematic when you have an idea that tells you that morality only comes from an authority figure where it's you know it has to come from a god a god has to tell you what to do and you are not taught how to figure out how to treat your fellow human being on your own i think these are ideas that we should not have more of them as a matter of fact i think it would be more positive for us in the country if we had less of them for example someone like mubarak bala is still in police custody now arrested for the imaginary crime of blasphemy and we've been trying to get him out of you know people who have been campaigning on social media and those who are on the ground trying to do the work to get him out but because of this strong connection to religion it's been so difficult because i, I feel it's because some people think what we're actually doing is service to allah or to the prophet or whatever and that's why this kind of thing is happening i think it would be much more positive if we had much less religion and we focus more on critical thinking and educating the public on how to think for yourself and how to be a better person for the sake of being a better person for the sake of your fellow man and woman and for the sake of your fellow nigerian so to speak so again it sounds like in order for us to live in peace and to live successful lives <laughs> to have a society that we can actually survive and exist in again we have to be looking at the community it's not just all about self but jide i would love for you to talk a little bit more about morality and the source of it because so many of us whose foundation is in either christianity or islam we do tend to think and believe that if you're going to teach your child you've got to teach them what's in one of those holy books in order for them to develop a moral compass so without religiosity without having those books as reference points where then should people look what should guide your behavior this is the question that philosophers theologians people who have been in the business of figuring out ethical practices over the centuries and even over the millennia this is a question that they've been you know battling with as as a humanist first of all if you're a humanist you believe that humans are in charge humans are uh, totally we have autonomy over what happens to us in terms of our lives you know making decisions for our lives going forward and all that if you want to get morality from a religious book or something you have to first convince a skeptic like me or someone out there that the book is authoritative but how could you do that when the person doesn't even share your belief in god or in the spiritual realm in the first place so that's why we have to set that aside and also many people are going to point to these books and say hey look these books sanction things like slavery the sanction misogyny the sanction killing people for blasphemy or for apostasy so we can't get our morality from them because they are obviously outdated so why don't we look for something more reason based something more human based for us to have a solid foundation for morality and for most people 
they get that from empathy. You know, the feeling that you have that if I put myself in the shoes of this person, I wouldn't want to experience what it is that they are experiencing. And because of that, because I have that compassion for my fellow human being, I don't want to cause harm to them. I don't want to bring pain to them. I don't want to deprive them of what is their right. And that can be a guide for morality. Some also look at it and say, okay, what if we assess any action that we have and we look at the consequence of that action on the other person? Is it going to bring a consequence that will maximize happiness, not just for the person, but for society as a whole? And these are the things that people have considered over the years as foundations for morality. You can use empathy, you can use the assessment about what the consequences of these actions that you do will be on not just the individual, but on the society as a whole. And these are facts that we can derive from simple things like scientific observation. And it, it doesn't even have to be scientific observation. You can just look at the world yourself and see how people are suffering and know that, hey, I don't want to be in this situation. I don't want to be a child in Yemen who has lost his parents to a religious fanatic blowing himself up because he believes he's going to get some reward in the afterlife or things like that. I don't want to be that child. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. And because of that, I'm not going to do something that will cause sorrow or unhappiness to other people. And we can use that as a guide for our moral framework in the world. Yes, so empathy is very key there. Warda, I want to know how you respond to what Jide has just said. What are your views? I feel like empathy it's a tool that we cannot dispense with right now like all over the world because we have different scary versions of religion out there that are encouraging people to do what is wrong in the name of religion and we have a lot of people thinking that if religion says this is right for me to do even if it doesn't make sense even if it feels like a very bad wicked thing to do then it's all right since the religion has said it's okay for me to do it so, and like I said earlier, we have people not actually checking in with their conscience, you know, just following a dogma. It's a lifestyle that is devoid of spirituality because when we connect to our spiritual selves, which is the part of ourselves that looks at things from um, what is the human thing to do, what is the right thing to do, then I think the world will just become a better place in that regard. I don't know if there is any other solution other than that. So for example, we have someone saying, they asked me to blow up a building where um, there are people, there are properties, and you ask them if they felt it was the right thing to do. But because we have been taught from an early age that you know we get our morals from religion, they feel like if the religion tells us to do it, then it must be the moral thing to do, which is not always the case. We have had cases where there are people who don't even believe in God, who don't even, you know, they don't associate with any religion out there, and they are very good people. So we have a lot of philanthropists, like who don't care about organized religion or anything. And then we have terrible people who, you know, go to the mosques, go to the church, they pray, you know, five times a day. They wear religious garments, they look religious, but deep down they are very bad people. And like I said earlier, we, we need less of that we need less of you know outward religious practices like we need more of people yeah performative yes yes performative um religiosity we, we need more of people you know questioning things and trying to do what is right and being empathetic with their neighbors and everybody yeah thank you so much warda oida do you have anything to add to that i'd like to know to what extent you think the good book helps to provide individuals with a working moral compass? Or, or is there something else that they need to be doing in addition to reading their Bibles and going to church? Um, of course, I mean, reading your Bible and going to church, it, they're all great actions and activities, but, and it's something that we haven't really discussed is that relationship with your God and what kind of conversations come from that relationship and how are you able to reflect those relationships in your day-to-day -day life, right? 
like I say, I think in Christianity, our God is a personable God. So it's a God that we say we have a relationship with. And so how do we believe God treats us and how do we respond to that? And I think most of the time when people are talking about morality, again, I think it's more about most people are just talking about power issues. I don't know if people are really talking about doing good and being just and being kind. And I remember reading a book about, I think it was the Bible on business or something. And it was talking about how, about DIY, right? You know, you might think, oh, I have to do everything myself because I want to save money. So now I've decided that if my water pipe bursts, I'm going to be the one that fix it. If my lights go out, I'm going to become the electrician. But actually, if we look like at biblical or Jewish culture, you know, their culture is that I need something, somebody is going to help me. So the plumber is helping me by fixing, you know, my pipes and I in turn reward him with finances. The electrician comes to help me fix my lights. And so it's, and that's why I say it's communicable. And so the best way for you to exist or move as a community of not just, you know, there's the one and then there's the many is that is how you treat other people. And so for me, that's why I can read my Bible from front to back, but if I'm not practicing the principles in it, then it's just a storybook. It's not a guide for life. And I guess I could read my iPad instructions as well. But if when I can't switch my iPad on, I won't switch my iPad on, even though I read in the book that it says switch my iPad on, then it's not doing what it's meant to do. You know, just to take it back a bit as well. And, and I say I'm judo Christian, like I truly believe that the continuation. So from the Jewish Torah into the New Testament of Christianity and the belief in, in Christ, that, that actually as a culture, they are taught to debate and discuss. And that discussion and debate is where you build, you can say, I believe this, or I don't believe this, or I understand this, or I, I don't understand this. And then you can be, and you can have conviction because you've been able to discuss and been able to grapple with things. And so when you're unable to, when you're blindly following things, then um, it's not necessarily morality. It's just being a sheep. Like they say, don't kill, so I won't kill. But do I not kill? Because ultimately I believe that not killing is, is the right thing to do. So I think for me, it's that there is that practice of religious tasks, but then there's the relationship of religion. I'm going to ask very quickly, and I just want to get your views before I go to my last question. How should you, as an individual, respond to being confronted with questions about your religious beliefs or lack of belief? What should your response be? For me, my response is just that I'm a Christian, you know, like I remember very recently somebody who was very atheist and they just wanted to go back to back with me and it wasn't a fight for me. I am who I am. And if, you know, he believes what he believes and I'm, that's what he believes. I'm not going to fight for who you are or who you identify as. I always wonder, like, I don't know, am I meant to be like, at war with this, but because I've comfortably come into, into my identity and I, I believe that, you know, it, it, that's when you can come into agreement with something when you've come into identity. I think the real issue is when people think because I'm Christian, I have all the answers about Christianity, which I don't. And I don't want to have to pretend like when people say, so, so if it says this, then what, then I don't know. I couldn't tell you because I don't necessarily know the answer to it. And I think that that's okay. And that's really where the clash comes when you feel like I don't have the answer to this and someone's going to come at me, you know, in this place. And because I can't defend that space, I think it's okay to be like, I don't know yet. I can try and maybe pray about it and ask God and, you know, get a revelation. But I just don't know in that, in that space. And I think that that's okay. Yeah, I should ask just as a, a follow-up question do you imagine that anything about your beliefs could change i don't want to ask what would it take to maybe change how you feel but it's more about do, do you even think about the possibility of changing your views or changing your religion 
or imagining that maybe something could happen and it would suddenly mean that you start thinking differently? Yeah, I've definitely had a crisis of faith and I, which I think I brought on myself because I was like, I think I believe too much. So, I mean, it's only right that I have to go down this unbelief journey because I want to actually feel what people feel when they say that they don't believe. And I went through that and that was an interesting time for me, but I just couldn't reconcile with that space. It just didn't feel real or right to me. So I definitely have gone through the journey and I also have spent time, you know, finding out about other religions as well. But change i think change is inevitable it's just like with relationships like you might say on your wedding day how you feel it's how you're going to feel every single day i don't believe it's like that i believe that you come into you know different levels of knowledge or feeling or emotion a couple of years ago i remember taking a course and then i'm just going you know with my friends saying was i even a christian before because i just felt so different you know based on like the kind of revelations and experiences i was having at that time so i definitely think i'll feel different over time and through experience but i truly believe that this is the path that i intend to walk like all my days on this green earth <laughs> wonderful and i'm going to go to gide now because gide being an atheist i am sure that you have lots of battles with different people every day, even if you don't want to fight, they probably bring the fight to you. So asking you the same question. There are two questions there. I'll go with the second one first, which is the, what would it take to change your mind? It depends on the claim that we're dealing with, right? So we're talking about a God, if, you know, we're talking about God now, we're talking about the God who has all the power, who has all knowledge and who presumably as well, you know, in Islam is called all merciful and all that. In Christianity is called love. God is love and, you know, things like that. So there are certain things I would expect to see in the world. I would expect to see more answered prayers. I'm not just talking about, oh, I prayed and God helped me to find my keys. I'm talking about more tangible things. Okay, suppose somebody wanted to pray about world hunger or something like that what would be the tangible results that we can see from that kind of prayer but even more specifically there are some more difficult things there are things that some atheists you know often talk about things like why won't god heal amputees i mean it's going to be very strong evidence if you could somehow get somebody whose limbs have been amputated to you know regrow them somehow we know there are some species that do that but humans don't that would be something really miraculous if you could pull it off that would be very strong but i mean not to go too deeply into that how should people react when their faiths are challenged i've had my faith challenged in the past before because while i was a christian i used to talk a lot with atheists as well i used to react i tried to react as measuredly as i could but sometimes i couldn't help but react with you know consternation because i felt like they were attacking my person directly and now that you know i'm an unbeliever it kind of makes me understand how people feel when you challenge their religion and that's why i don't try to go into these discussions assuming that the person is stupid or the person is unintelligent there are several intelligent religious people that i know and i mean two of them are on this platform with me right now there are several intelligent people that you know are muslims are christians who have contributed to science who have contributed to technology who have contributed to economics who have contributed to mathematics and all that so you don't want to go into these conversations assuming that the people you are talking to are stupid they're not stupid there might be some other psychological factors that play into this and that's what i try to find out when i have these discussions with them oftentimes i get to realize that okay these people are maybe just afraid of going to hell because that's what they've always been told since they were you know a child or something and you can now attack it from there and say okay here's why i don't think there's a hell and you just outline all that for them and you just you know try to present the evidence to them as charitably as you can but i don't think we should go into these discussions trying to disrespect the other person. I think we should all be open to evidence. I think we should all be open to reason and critical thinking. And I think that's how we can have productive discussions about it because we're in a democracy. And the fundamental 
property of a democracy is the ability to dialogue, freedom of speech, as we call it. So let ideas be in the market and let people just debate it and let people be taught how to think critically about these issues. And we're going to make progress, undoubtedly, as um, I can see that we're already making in our current culture. Thank you so much. And going to Warda now. And the question I have for you is, how should people respond when they're challenged about their religion? But I also would like to know if you think, given where you are now, there's a possibility that your views or your beliefs might change. My religion actually is one of the most controversial religions in the world. So when people come to me asking questions, you know, trying to challenge why it is that I have chosen this religion for myself, I try to like see where they are coming from and to get their own perspectives. Because to be honest, um, people don't actually take their time to look into what exactly is it this religion says or how do i get to study this religion fastest way to learn about the religion is to look at those who are practicing it so what are their values how do they conduct themselves in society and so most times that's what people look like and i can't blame them so for example they come to me asking about why islam oppresses women why there is so much violence in the world and you know people are pointing at islam what i just tell them is it's easy to assume things about someone's faith or a particular religion based on what based on what some adherents of the faith are doing or how they are conducting themselves and the bad things they are doing so i just you know try to answer their questions from what I understand about religion and also encourage them to find out more from the actual sources of the religion. So for example, we have people getting killed for blasphemy. And when you actually look into the Quran, you see that there is no punishment for blasphemy in the Quran. You see that what Muslims are actually instructed to do is to ignore. But then we have a lot of interpretations of religions out there, you know, scholars giving opinions on what should actually be done to people. And Muslims even aren't even looking into what the scripture says anymore. This is what this person who is in a position of authority has said, and this is what we are going to do because they feel like these people have gained a level of respect in the community and whatever they say is a reflection of what God actually wants from us, like as believing people. So I will just try to explain things to them and try to lead them to where they can read more on what I have explained to them because it's actually normal. It has become a normal thing for people to challenge me based on my beliefs. I also think that part of spirituality especially for Muslims, is sitting down, questioning everything they've been taught about religion and trying to find out things from themselves from scratch. Because what most people practice is a dogma. And, you know, it's there is this binary of heaven and hell. Like, if you do this, you are going to heaven. If you do this, you are going to hell. And a lot of people find that religion actually takes away from their individual choice and from their right to freedom to you know choose to live their lives the way they want and choose like so it's it's driving a lot of people like more and more people away from religion because these are actual issues that um religious communities should be talking about but i have found out that a lot of communities are reluctant to have these conversations that's very very helpful thank you very much and, and i love all your answers so to round up, I have a somewhat provocative question. Now, even just going by this conversation and the way that we've been able to have this joyous exchange of ideas based on what can often be you know, a problematic topic that people very easily get offended by, what it tells me is that Nigerians are becoming a lot more tolerant, a lot more open to listening to what other people have to say. So I want us to look at 10 years into the future. In 2031, do you think 
that religion will matter less to Nigerians? Personally, I'm seeing a growing trend of young people drifting away from religion for different reasons. And I feel like some of the reasons are actually tied to the growing gap between what um, religion tells us is right and actual morals that everybody should embody in a society. And then we have issues like spiritual abuse in religious organizations. We have issues like when young people are getting to understand that, for example, corrupt societies or corrupt countries are using religion to enforce cohesion and order in the society and actually preventing people from speaking up against certain ills. And a lot of people are actually finding that most religious organizations are not even good role models for enforcing morals in the society. And we're actually paying attention to what makes us similar as human beings rather than um, what are the differences between our beliefs? And I feel like young Nigerians are having these conversations and, you know, trying to bridge the gap between how religion was practiced in the past, where people allowed various beliefs to divide them and cause problems in society. So I think with this trend going on and with the conversations we are having um, right now, there is hope that in the next 10 years, Nigeria will get to a place where people choose to see our common humanity rather than the differences in our beliefs. And Oida, what are your thoughts, Nigeria in 10 years? Nigeria is going to be a great land in 10 years' time. <laughs> Let me prophesy good things over this nation. But I actually believe that the issue is not religion, it's actually culture. And I think that younger people are going away from that, you know, controlling or the power divide or and the cultural divide that actually has found its way into religious organizations and i think the more we come to see ourselves as one people then i think that people will find that that religion is still equally as important as it has been for hundreds and thousands of years and it is intrinsic to who we are as a people and actually when i think about the uk the fastest growing church in the uk probably nigerian churches you know what's the difference the difference is they're not having to deal with most of the cultural constraints that you know we have had to deal with and i truly believe it's going to be the same here as as we age and as we are more open to discussing and inviting people and not commanding people then i think people will still see that there is there's an important in building up your spiritual practice and yeah i don't see it declining thank you very much and i'll come to you last jide i hate to say it but i think i agree with oinda on this <laughs> that um religion is not likely to decline in terms of you know the population or the share of the population nigeria is very lacks when it comes to measuring statistics anyway but from some of the most recent estimates that i've uh, been able to look up less than one percent of nigerians can be classified as atheists and that's even when you're at the most generous you know trying to classify at the most generous so what i would say is i think that there will be more should i say advocacy there'll be more people speaking against religion and what this is going to do is not going to make people to become more atheists or agnostics but i think it's going to reduce the share of people who can be classified as fundamentalists you know people who take to religion with so much ardor that it's almost to a fault we're going to see as i predict it's not a prophecy because there's no god telling me this but i think that there will be less people in the religious side but the side that describes themselves as spiritual but not religious is going to increase there's going to be less people who want to follow dogmatic rules about when you have to go to church or how many times you have to pray per day or you know what share of your income you have to donate to a church or something there's going to be less people doing that kind of stuff and there's going to be more people who are more introspective who look more into themselves, who do more of meditation, or even just do their prayer and their fasting on their own and things like that. 
However, I don't think this is going to cause any serious shift in the total religious landscape, especially when it comes to the politics of Nigeria. And that's actually where the real issue is. Uh, because what we need is not just, okay, people are not being religious anymore. What we need is something that has a down top effect. What exactly is the effect of people switching from religion to spiritual but not religious? We want to see, like Warda suggested, we want to see more people shifting from book-based morality to empathy-based morality to altruism-based kind of morality where people can look at the other person and say, you know what, even if you disagree with me on my religious views, I'm going to tolerate you. I'm going to live with you. We're going to live together in peace and harmony because beyond the fact that you don't share my religious views, I see you as human and I value you as that. And because of that, we're not going to have any tussle over this. And that's what I want us to see. That's what I want the country to you know, be like going forward. It doesn't look like something that's going to happen in 2031 or by 2031, I should say. But you never can tell. I mean, two years ago, I couldn't have predicted that NSAS would have happened last year. But then we had that. The Gen Z, as they are called, uh, they're very vibrant. They're very innovative. And they seem like they know how to demand their rights better than the millennials of Nigeria do. So they give me hope that perhaps we can have a more radical shift in the landscape by 2031. But my prediction, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed and then we'll just see how it goes. I do totally agree with you, actually. The sheer volume of people who talk about, you know, mental health and kindness and empathy is enough indication to me that people are moving in that direction where they're thinking about their common humanity and community, like Oyinda mentioned, rather than just religious dogma. So like you, Jide, I am keeping my fingers crossed. And Wada, I'm really hoping for this future that you have described because it seems right to me. It has people at the very center of it. So that's us done with this panel on religion and spirituality, one of the intergenerational conversations that we're having at Ake Festival this year. And I want to say a huge thank you to Jide Adigo, to Oyinda Fakeye, and to Warda Abbas for joining us here today and for sharing their knowledge and sharing their beliefs as well. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you so much. It was really, really interesting. And thank you to my panelists. I loved listening to you and your perspectives. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm very grateful. And thanks to Warda and Oindamola as well. Five Minutes Madness, only you can understand. Visit myspecter.com to get your Spectre experience. Spectre, loans in five minutes.